Hello and welcome to Cartography. This is the first of a series of short films that accompany our MOOC on cartography. And to join me today is expert cartographer, John Nelson, and even more expert cartographer, <laughs> Edie Punt. Hi. My name's Ken Field. And uh, we're gonna just spend a few minutes today talking about cartography, what it means, and what it means to be a smarter map maker, how we think about making maps, and really try to encourage you to think about going beyond the defaults. Maybe that's a good phrase to, to, to start off with. So, first off, let's define what cartography is, I guess. Uh, John, do you want to give us what your what definition is, is? What is cartography? Cartography is the communication of a geographic phenomenon, the visual communication. So, the geography of cart. And it's this beautiful mix of geography, which is already awesome, and art, which is already awesome. And then you get awesome plus awesome, and it's just cartography. Beat that. Be easy. Beat awesome plus awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's really combining the idea of where things are and why they're there, so the spatial component, with the art. And it's really about communication. So finding a way to communicate those spatial phenomenon in a way that resonates with people and better helps them understand. I kind of like to think about the word or the letters that make up the word, because to me it encompasses a lot of different aspects. So we start off with the C. And that to me shouts compromise because everything about making a map is a compromise. You know, a cartographer makes decisions all the time about what to put on the map, what to take off the map. And there are a lot of compromises. Well, you can't put the whole world on you a piece put of paper. Everything on the map. It's true. Yeah, yeah. That's why maps exist. Yeah. Compromise. Okay. Secondly, uh, is this little word art. You know, there is a component of artistry in making a great looking map. Uh, this isn't just about making maps look pretty, but it's the artistry of communication. And the next letter along is the O, and I think that stands for opportunity. So making a map is an opportunity to tell your audience something interesting, to communicate a story, to give people facts. Or if you don't make a map at all. The worst map is one that never gets made. We're gonna skip a whole load of letters and mush them into one here. Talk about graph. Graph to me is indicative of a mode of communication. So we go to school and we get taught to read and write and we get taught to use numbers. We very rarely get taught to communicate using graphs or graphics. And there is a graphical language, a syntax, an alphabet even. That's what this MOOC is really all about, getting us to think about communicating in a graphical way. What works well, what perhaps doesn't work so well. So we might call that graphicacy. Graphicacy? Ooh, like literacy. Yeah. But and that's not my term, this is a 1958 yeah. term. Is that we're, how it's pronounced? It, you can pronounce it how you like. We're bringing it back. You're going to learn <laughs> to be graphicate. Okay. Yeah? Graphicate. Okay. Yep. And then this final letter, just hanging out on the end here, the why. To me, whenever you make a map, you ask yourself why. Why am I choosing this particular set of symbols? Why have I processed my data in a particular way? And I think that's always important to keep that in mind, is, is to ask yourself a lot of questions about why you're doing things in a certain way. Every bit of ink or screen pixel you put mm -hmm. on there has to have a reason. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just noise. I think yeah. the why is a super powerful component of cartography. Yeah. And that's what we're going to try to encourage everyone to do by taking this MOOC, is to think about the whys of making a map and to learn to sort of not just accept software defaults, but go a little bit beyond them and think about working with them in order to, to create your, your beautifully artistic graphicate map. So, why do you make a map? I make a map because I have to. I love it. Making maps is so much fun. But really, I make a map because often a piece of data looks pretty interesting to me, and I think that there's something inside it. So you start with a data set, typically? I do. Okay. And the inverse of that is sometimes I'll have a, a technique I want to try out, and the data itself is kind of a, a second hand. Uh, you know, maybe I want to try a different kind of coastline effect. I don't necessarily always start with the data. I think a lot of cartographers work that way. You might want to try something interesting, and the data itself is just supporting that. Sometimes you just need to explain the reality of aware. So maybe it's a, an article that lists a lot of different places and movement of goods or ideas or people, and that 
entire concept, that whole story is so much easier for somebody to understand if they can mm. see it in a map. So once we move past the purpose, you know, you've got your purpose for the map, then we kind of get into a, a, a process. Mm. Okay. So, you know, what, what's your process of, of map making? I think a lot depends on what kind of map you're making. Who are you making it for? Are you making a map that's going to be on a piece of paper and, you know, hung on a telephone pole? Well, that's going to be a different process right. than you're going to make a web map that's going to go out to, you know, hundreds, thousands of that's people. That's a good point. Know your audience. Know why you're making the yeah. map. Ask yourself right. why you're making the map. For me, I, I like to think of the process as an iterative one. Definitely. Because you, you never have a linear process of starting to make the map and then da 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 yep. to finish. It, it doesn't yep. work like that. Quite often you find things out as you go along and you change things or... And it's hard to know when you're done. Sure. <laughs> like, any, like any creative process, you always want to tweak something. And if you see it later, uh, you think, or oh, I wish I could have done something differently. You're Ken, you think it's done, then Edie walks by your yeah. office and says, Ken, I nope. don't like that. Nope. Change it. Yeah. I also think that maybe, you know, uh, there's, this, there's an element of truth in 90% of the map takes 10% of the time. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the final That's 10% true. takes maybe another 90% of the time. So you do have to work out when, when you're done with the map. So maybe that's so, a good, good place to talk a little bit about some of the constraints on map making. Because this, this doesn't just exist in a, a beautiful, open, I can do what I like kind of environment, right? right? If you pay for the band, you name the tune. Right? So if you're making a map for someone, yeah. you have to take their input, you have to know what their purpose is and what their objectives are, and you're sort of uh, stuck with whatever data you're working with because it's been handed to you and you have a task and you have a deadline. Well, and then there's the classic cartography constraint of you can pick your scale, mm -hmm. you can pick your extent of geography, yeah. and you can pick your size of the output, mm -hmm. but you can only have two of those three things, right? You can't, you can't have all three. Right, so, but you can, you can overcome that with uh, multi-scale web mapping, but right? then you've yep. got other constraints like exactly. technology. And also, it's a good idea to keep the user in mind. Who's going to be looking at your map? Are, mm -hmm. are you making a map for children? Are you making it for school kids? Are you making it for foreign language tourists? Right, you know, these somebody are all issues that color, vision impairment. Right. Uh, I like to think about the old adage of form and function. You know, the form of your map should support the function uh, that you're trying to communicate. And certainly, um, sometimes there's an inherent theme in the data that can have an influence on what, what uh, design sensibility you bring to the map that you're yeah. making. I mean, yeah. you can go too far. Yeah, you don't... Well, like an over-the-top pirate map with flaming skulls and... Yeah. Well, if you're, I mean, if you're mapping something that's a really serious topic, you don't want to have a goofy, light-hearted yeah, font, for right. example. Exactly. Um, like Comic Sans. Like Comic Sans. So going back to this idea of graphicacy, graphic yeah, you thought, you thought, you thought no. we were done, didn't you? Yeah, graphicacy. Um, I think of a nice way to making a map is to structure the way you lay out the graphics to communicate. So if you think about the written word, uh, mm -hmm. perhaps in a book, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, or in the spoken word, we're we're linking letters into words, into paragraphs, sentences, mm -hmm. and hopefully we're being reasonably intelligible. You know, people are yeah. following what we're saying. Mm -hmm. yep. And everything's coming at you in serial, one word after the other. We're trained to think about yeah, it's a train decoding of thought. Yeah, train of thought. language in mm -hmm. that way. But with maps, you know, you look at any of those on the wall behind, it's, it's everything's in one go, yeah, right? It's all at once. So our brain is struggling to try to disentangle all of that and thinking about trying to structure that message is important. Yeah, it's I a think, constraint. I think yeah. you can use the tools that are pretty well known in graphic design to bring out what's, what's the first message, what's the most important thing mm. that you want somebody to see first and, and use those graphical tools, the graphicacy, make sure that the primary message comes out first. And one strategy is you can make a series of maps, and each series of maps introduces some oh. kind of walking into a phenomenon. Right. Start with a broad view. But of even something there, they're going to have look. a lot in common to sort of ground your Absolutely. reader, so It'll they be a family of maps. they are um, oriented to mm -hmm. to what what's changing about the message mm -hmm. on each map. I kind of like looking at old 
maps. I because, love it. Because okay. they give you hints about what works really well, what perhaps doesn't work. So, you know, let's go back. Let's look at uh, Erwin Royce's Atlas oh. of Global Geography, mm -hmm. 1944. Classic. He Beautiful. makes gorgeous maps. I find he uses symbology and pictorial components and icons and color really magnificently. And when you think about some of the constraints on the technology of the time, you know, printing, 1944. Yeah. I appreciate his hand. It's before these tools that automated a lot of the process. Right. Right, he's, he's forming these largely from scratch and airbrushing and painting and stenciling and it's, it's just profound how much effort was yeah. involved back then. And when you have a craft that involves so much effort from front to back, then I think you're more invested in something instead of just kind of cranking through it right. in a digital process. The thing that he was so masterful at is depicting landforms. Mm. And I think that is where he really nails the aesthetics in his maps. Yeah. And as artistic as they are, they're incredibly accurate too. He's not yeah. just putting mountain ranges here because they fit mm. in. I mean, that's actually where the mountains are and, and what they look like. I mean, he nails it. Yeah, what I, what I quite like, of course, and Atlas isn't just about topography and natural world. Right. He uses some really revolutionary, innovative statistical charting. You know, right. sort of almost um, 3D prism maps. Yep. And um, amazing cutaways. Yeah, and, and again, yeah. doing this by the hand. Profiles of these landforms. You know, amazing. working out what angles to actually show all of this mm -hmm. app that's gonna work. Mm -hmm. And, and I, think, I think more than anything, what this Atlas teaches me is, you know, the amount of time it must have taken to think through all of this work. Yeah. Um, and that to me is maybe, maybe a difficulty with modern cartography, this compression of time. You can make a map in 10 seconds now, whereas maybe it took him two weeks to do the same thing or even right. longer. Right. Um, and that's why we're trying to encourage this thinking about cartography and going back to some of these classics. <laughs> We're going to now talk about some great cartographers. We're going to call them map people. Uh, I'm going to throw out a name and let's get a reaction. Yeah, Tom Patterson. Oh! Tom. Tom. Yeah. <laughs> Tom is somebody who I don't think has ever done anything or come up with an idea that he hasn't openly shared with yeah. everyone. So Tom works the National Park Service in the US and uh, anybody who's been to a national park will have used one of his products, one of his maps, and you know, they're, they're just, they are works of art. Art, absolutely. But he's kind of got a, a side job of, like you say, just doing stuff, yeah. and websites and various resources. And um, really, the whole point about talking about these map people is go and check out their work. Yeah. Go and have a look what Tom has been doing over his career. Yeah. Check out his website and uh, get some inspiration. Something that I'm especially be impressed better. with about Tom is, He's got these two worlds, right? This very artistic sensibility and then a technical mastery. Yeah. So the mathematics involved in projections is, of course, intimidating to somebody like me. Mm. But he has his own projection. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And he's got that over there. And meanwhile, he's doing these amazing shaded relief yeah. works of art. Yeah. Uh, and that's all the same human being rolled up into one Tom Patterson well, package. Well, yeah. is it? I mean, there maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe there's more than one. Maybe. Who knows? Anyway, yeah. check out Tom's work. It's great. A lot of the times we make our maps using computers now, but it hasn't always been that way. And I thought it might be fun to have a look at some of the oldie worldy tools of the trade. Yeah. It's got a ring to it. I like it. I'm just gonna pick up my little magic box here. Ooh. What do you got, Ken? How about that? Looks familiar, Ken. Mr. Nelson, what is it? Looks unfamiliar, Ken. I don't know what this is. Uh, I don't know what a person would use this for. Okay. Edie. Well, Ken, as you know, this belongs to oh, me. As you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep, this is my toy. Yep. So this is a scriber. And this is actually a special type of scriber. It's a swivel scriber. As you notice, parts of it swivel. It's, yeah, it's swiveled. There's even a little pin in here where you can set it to not swivel. Is this a line drawer, like an analog line yes. drawer, and you can swap out but pen tips or those, scrape tips? You're right, it's scrapes. We used to make maps in have. reverse. So have. we'd have something called scribe coat. Okay. You'd scrape off with this exactly okay. where you wanted the light to come through, which mm. would be 
where the ink would be. Try and make your maps in reverse and see how you get Yeah, well, so this yeah. one swivels. There you go. So when was the last time you used this? Um, <laughs> in school. Yeah. 2009. No. <laughs> 2000. Uh, that's probably a good point at which to stop this week's <laughs> tool of the week. Scriber. On to Carto fails. Uh, that's my term. I think I made it up. I may have stolen it from somewhere, but uh, a lot of things get me a bit angsty about maps. You know, when I see things on them and they, they like, Arr! one of my uh, pet peeves is uh, hyperbole. You know, it's the exaggerated statement on a map. You know, this, this map shows uh, something wonderful and fantastic, or even, you know, here are 10 maps that are going to change the way you think about, Great. you know, life, the universe <laughs> and everything. And I, I, it's just like, let's, let's keep our maps a little bit more respectful and perhaps a little less shouty. I don't need to know that your map is a map. And I don't need to know that the legend on a map is You don't a label your legend as such? <laughs> if you What if somebody legend, doesn't know? Too, too much, too much. What about, I love maps. We all love maps, right? Yeah, that's why we get into this is a cardo yeah. fail. Well, it's yeah, a cardo fail for some. I would say it's not a cardo fail. I think it's a pet peeve. I hear a lot of people say, "I've always loved maps," and the thing this is, this isn't a cardo fail. This is a it, cardo good. Here's the th it is good. <laughs> it is good, but it's a cardo success. It is. Yeah, it's it's an overly obvious statement. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, you've convinced me. Yeah. So not you know, you no convincing. longer love maps, right? This is, uh, this is an awkward moment. I need to go take a nap. <laughs> okay. uh, well, let's finish off with uh, Death by Pushpin. Mm. Yeah, Red Dot Fever. Mm. This, this, yeah. this tendency, Measles maps, yeah, I've heard it's it called. Yeah, this tendency of just, I've got, I've got data, I've got two trillion points. I've got it's chicken all pox. Go, all got to go on my map. It's all yeah. got to go. Where is it all? And that, to me, just says that the person making the map didn't think about what they could leave off, you know. Yeah. It's just like, yeah. I've got all this data. Or they could I'm have gonna aggregated in some could, way. You could do a lot of stuff. We're going to learn yeah. A lot of techniques in the exercises on the MOOC about how to process this data, but you know, does your map have mm. a title? It doesn't make sense. Does it have a lot of red dots on it? Uh, does it say I love maps? So with that, I, I'd like to offer you both a, a, a biscuit. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, thank you, Ken. Okay. Oh, one of each. Lovely. Okay. Thanks. Cheers. Mm -hmm.